The Federal Reserve has now entered its two-day routine policy meeting with an interest rate decision due tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern. And joining me now to break down what's expected, what it means for you, is Greg McBride, Bankrate Chief Financial Analyst. Uh, Greg, it's great to have you on the show. And what are we expecting to hear from the Fed tomorrow? Yeah, you know, the Fed is not nearly as close to cutting rates as uh, they may have thought they were back in March. We've had a run of bad inflation numbers, uh, and we need to see that reverse. We need to go on a winning streak, get a few months of, of good inflation numbers that reinforce this idea that inflation's headed to 2 percent before the Fed can feel comfortable cutting interest rates. And in the meantime, the economy's strong enough, unemployment's low enough. There's nothing compelling them to cut rates until they feel comfortable about inflation. So expect them to really hammer that point home, uh, reinforcing that you know, their job is to get inflation to 2 percent, that that's mm -hmm. what they're uh, focused on. Uh, and you know, I think maybe giving a little bit of, uh, a, of tough talk about the fact that interest rates are going to stay at these levels uh, mm -hmm. and, until they're comfortable with that inflation's going moving lower. What does that mean for Americans? Well, for savers, it means let the good times roll, because uh, you know, right now, if you've got your money in the right place on cash and other safe haven investments, you're earning returns that well exceed inflation, and that's poised to continue for the foreseeable future, not just until the Fed starts to cut rates, Kristen, but even once they do. Uh, interest rates took the elevator going up, but they're going to take the stairs coming down. So, you know, those, those returns that you're earning on, on things like savings accounts, money markets, uh, they're going to continue to outpace inflation even as the Fed uh, begins to cut interest rates. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, good news for savers, not so good news for borrowers. Variable rate debt like credit card debt, those rates are going to stay north of 20 percent, not really going to come down until the Fed starts to cut rates. And even then, they're going to cut them modestly. So I think from a borrower's perspective, you really have to take the bull by the horns and, and uh, work at hammering away yeah. on that debt. Interest rates aren't going to fall fast enough to bail you out. Uh, Greg, we've talked a lot about high yield savings accounts, uh, certainly on this show, but you mentioned money markets, and I'd like you to dive in a little bit deeper into money markets, how they differ from a high yield savings account, and just how safe your money is in a money market. Well, there's really two different types of money markets. There are money market deposit accounts, which are just like high yield savings accounts. They're federally insured. They yeah, have a lot of the same transaction restrictions, kind of six of one, half dozen of the other. Those are bank products. A lot of those offering yields well over 5% federally insured. Then there are money market mutual funds, very safe, but not federally insured. And the returns here are derived from, uh, just like other mutual funds, the investments held by the fund. Uh, short-term money market uh, in instruments of the money market. So uh, money funds are basically fishing from the same pond of investments. The d diversion in returns that you see there is more just related to expenses. So a lot of money funds returns tend to be pretty tightly clustered as opposed to a money market deposit account or a high yield savings account where the return is up to what the bank is just willing to pay. What about for Americans? We've talked about savers, uh, but American investors, that is, if we did see uh, rates take the elevator up, but a step-by-step -step approach on the way down. How will that impact stocks and, and thus investors? There has been, I think, this uh, myopic view among investors. Uh, you know, investors love lower interest rates. And so I think there's been this myopic view of, uh, you know, that timetable getting pushed back. And so we've seen the rally in stocks uh, stall out. But I think we're missing the forest for the trees in the sense that the economy is still uh, in remarkably robust shape. Unemployment's been below 4 percent for almost two and a half years, uh, longest stretch since the 1960s. And so that backdrop, it's very positive for corporate earnings. Uh, and those earnings ultimately drive stock prices. So, yes, I, you know, we, you see some volatility in the meantime as, you know, we've got to deal with the uncertainty of when and how much the Fed's going to cut rates. But the bottom line is if the economy's holding up, that in all, that's ultimately going to be good for stock prices. Interesting. Uh, so in terms of when we might get the first rate cut, what is an estimate on that that you expect? The way I look at it is this. We have to go on a winning streak of better inflation numbers. And even if that started now, we'd have to get, I think, three rounds of, of good and better data before the Fed really gets comfortable uh, enough to cut rates. Is that going to happen by the time they meet at the end of July? I doubt it. Good, but I doubt it. So realistically, that puts us at September. So I don't see how they're going to be able to cut rates before September uh, unless we have an immediate and, and very noticeable reversal on the trend on inflation. And, you know, given what oil prices are, 
I don't think that's in the cards. I do want to get your take here uh, more about the data uh, that is, Greg, because obviously that's what the Fed is looking at here, and, and that does, as you mentioned, the economy drive earnings, which drive stocks. Uh, but stagflation was uh, used that word uh, down here on the trading floor for the first time uh, that I've heard it used uh, down here. Someone who's been down here for more than a decade uh, during Biden's presidency, uh, during this cycle with uh, Powell as the Fed chair, and that is uh, slow growth and uh, still higher than expected inflation. So even though the jobs picture is holding up well, even though it definitely seems like some of these large cap companies are able to manage this. Uh, quite well, and that's showing up in earnings. What else is the economic data telling you right now that could impact the Fed's path? Well, we heard that word stagflation a lot last week when the GDP numbers came out. Uh, and and but once you look below the surface, below that headline number, uh, you, you know you kind of cast aside those worries. The headline GDP number came in at 1.6. That was much lower than expected. But when you look below the surface, you found that the main drags were inventory and foreign trade. Well, one of the reasons foreign trade was such a drag is because imports soared. So we saw strength in consumer spending and soaring imports, which also means consumers and businesses are spending money. So all of which is positive for the economy. So I think the economy is in better shape than that GDP number would have indicated. I think it vanquishes a lot of those concerns about stagflation. Yeah, we're still dealing with inflation that's stubborn, uh, but it's come down mightily from 9 percent now down uh, below 4 percent. And, you know, there's still a ways to go to get it to 2 percent. But, but, you know, we have moved significantly in the right direction. I would like to get your take uh, for Americans, uh, whether they're savers or investors or both. Uh, such an about face by the Fed. I think has caught some people off guard, right? And, and in some ways kind of called into a question the real credibility here in terms of suddenly forecasting three rate cuts in December of last year, pressured, of course, by the stock market and then doing such an about face uh, three months later. What's your take on that? Well, the, the, the Fed follows the data and the data since really the first of the year has not been good on the inflation front. Every number we've got has come in hot. Uh, and, you know, we've not only seen the, the, the progress of inflation moving lower stall out, but we've started to move back up a little bit. And so, you know, I, that warrants an about face. You know, the Fed's not in a position to begin cutting rates with that type of backdrop. You know, I think the other thing is investors were really in sort of fantasy land to begin with, with this idea that the Fed is going to cut rates six or seven times this year. And we were also going to get double digit earnings growth in the S&P 500. I mean, you may get one or the other, but you're not going to get both at the same time. And so I think those expectations mm -hmm. getting reined in, too. So, uh, yes, the, the Fed has to make an about face justified by the data. But it was investors that were you know, really, you know, I think, far out there on the expectations of, of rate cuts. And that has had to, to change dramatically. What's the balance here in terms of a risk uh, that could be out there for keeping rates higher for too long? The risk of keeping rates too high for too long is that that could rob the economy of momentum uh, and push us into either you know, a significant slowdown or an outright recession. Those fears were a lot higher this time last year. Uh, there were you know, pretty uh, common consensus among economists. More than two out of three were forecasting we'd have a recession as a result of the sharpest pace of rate increases in 40 years. And so far, that hasn't panned out. The economy's held up remarkably well. But we're not out of the woods. And that, that, that reason being is the longer the Fed holds rates at these high levels, uh, you know, it, there is the risk that something eventually goes bump in the night, whether it's commercial real estate or something else, that then topples the economy into a deeper slowdown. So that's the tightrope they have to walk. Mm -hmm. They don't want to cut rates too soon uh, and let the uh, inflation genie back out of the bottle. But they also don't want to cut rates too late and, and risk jeopardizing the economic expansion. Are there pockets of the economy, Greg, uh, that do look in jeopardy to you uh, as we've seen rates remain higher for longer? Well, there are certainly pockets of consumers that are, uh, you know, that are not feeling nearly as rosy as, as the headline numbers on the economy and unemployment would suggest. About 60 percent of households live paycheck to paycheck, and they are feeling it, uh, not just from the inflation, uh, but the fact that prices are still high. So even though inflation has slowed, that just means the prices aren't going up as fast as they were, but they're still going up, and they're going up on top of the cumulative 20 or 25 percent increase that we've seen over the last two or three years. So households really feeling it, and that's why we've seen trends like excess savings being run down, credit card debt being run up, more people carrying balances uh, for a longer period of time, and doing so when credit card rates are at, at a record high. So I think pretty clear signs of that there are millions of consumers feeling some level 
uh, of distress there. Uh, and I think, you know, it's been well chronicled, but, you know, the, the mm -hmm. commercial real estate, specifically office sector real estate, you know, we don't know what we don't know there yet. There's still a lot of debt that has to be refinanced at much higher rates and at lower valuations. We don't exactly know how that's going to shake out. And so until we have greater clarity there, Kristen, I think that's one of those risk factors, economically speaking. All right, Greg McBride, Chief Financial Analyst at Bankrate. Uh, Greg, always a pleasure. Thank you.